Hello, and welcome to the Happy Insights Podcast. I am your host, Happy Ali. And as you might know, this is the place where I love to blur the lines between spirituality and science. And right now, we're about to get really blurry. So get ready for a treat today, because today I have the most incredible woman on the show, someone who has devoted pretty much her entire adult life to helping humanity raise its consciousness, raise its vibration to make this world a better place. She is an author, a leader, a speaker, a pioneer, a teacher who has been tapping into higher dimensions and channeling 12 archangel beings known as Theo for over 50 years. Theo and Sheila have been teaching universal truths and universal laws since the early 70s, way before channeling was even called channeling. So let's welcome to the show, Sheila Gillette. Hello, Sheila. Hi, Happy. It's so good to be with you. And thank you for the kind words. Oh, my God. I I mean, I couldn't, I could have written that. I've made it like a thousand times longer because your accomplishments are just huge, huge. (laughs) I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because people like you are the reason that the world is becoming better. And without people like you, I don't know what this world would be like. Well, that's the intention. You know, we're living in a, in a time of tremendous consciousness shift. And certainly that's why I do the work that I do with the collective angelic known as Theo and have been doing it all these years. They've been portending of this time that we're living in now four or five decades and here we are we're shifting dramatically because it's letting us all know we're more than this physical existence our souls are much bigger than we think they are and we know more than we think we do so it's just tapping into all of the knowledge of who we are now before we go any further i kind of want to ask you to kind of explain the channeling process because I know there's some new people uh, watching this and it'll be people who don't really know what happens or how channeling happens. Would you mind just giving us a little explanation of how that works? I'll be happy to. Um, In 1969, when I opened up to doing this after a near-death experience, I I was spoken of in the scientific community as a direct voice trance medium. The word channeling hadn't even been coined as as a phrase to be used for this type of work. But what I do is I work with 12 archangels that collectively are known by the name Theo. And I allow that energy, that frequency, if you would, to come into my body to use my body and to speak directly to you. They speak in a different voice, one voice, to share the wisdom that they have to give us now in this time of change. And so what I do is just move over and allow them to to speak. Now, this happened to me spontaneously. And I know there are many people, as we know, over the years, telling channeling that word has become used for a lot of things but it's a conduit of energy to give information and I allow my body and my voice my vocal cords I should say to be used by these auspicious teachers that we have to share this this wisdom with us now which is quite empowering for each and every one of us. And we all channel our soul's energy. We all channel, if you would, our conduits for creative energy. And that's who we are as a species and as souls. And it's in a form that's however comfortable individually. You know, Happy, you've heard me speak about the channel of the artist, you know, they're channeling their creative energy to give to give us, whether it's a writer giving us information in books and stories, a musician composing music, uh, a, a person who is a fine artist painting pictures or sculpting, 
So we all channel our creative energy in ways that are comfortable for us to do so. Yeah, I, I'm an artist myself. So I know sometimes I go into a zone and I don't even know how the art, mm -hmm. whether it's writing or drawing, where it comes from. And, and I've been toying with that concept of channeling, channeling, and I've, and I've been able to do it a few times, but not like you. I mean, oh my God. I, and this, was it harder in the beginning to do it or was it uncomfortable? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was kind of scary if you, you can probably imagine, but I, um, I made a contract with God when I was in intensive care and had my near death experience. And I said, God, give me a job. I'll do anything. And after I was strong enough out of the hospital and strong enough to hold the energy, six months after I was released from the hospital, I started having all kinds of psychic phenomena happening externally to me, internally to me. I could hear messages in my inner mind being given to me. I could um, I could move objects with my mind. I and now I'm not sure if I did it or spirit did it for me, but I had all kinds of phenomenal experiences. But I trusted because I remember that moment I made the commitment that I wanted to live and that I would do whatever it took. So spirit knew, the angels knew, I needed external and internal confirmations to trust what was happening to me. And I didn't have a mentor because... There weren't any. I didn't know anybody doing this kind of thing. So I did find a book on Edgar Casey, and it described his process. And I thought, well, that's what's happening to me. And it gave me some confidence. And, and a few years later, not too long, their scientists invited me to be tested for my psychic ability. And that really gave me more confidence, as you can imagine, because I didn't know anybody that was doing what I was doing. And it wasn't a time that it was easily talked about because people were fearful of it. There, And now over the years, there have been waves of awakening and many people awakening to, to channel um, and to, to have these extraordinary experiences but now they're becoming our new ordinary because it is our soul right if you would our our gift we give to life itself to be that open channel for the energy that can that can move through us in a very creative way yeah, it's a wonderful phenomenon. And thank you for being the, the, one of the pioneers and being such a beacon of light for the rest of us. Um, I am, you know, we are as a collective so grateful because um, something so unusual once upon a time is so talked about now. And, you know, you were actually one of the, we were the reason that Esther Hicks began meditating. And she's one of the more popular, she's actually probably the most popular named that someone who channels most people don't even know abraham is channeled um but so you have not only influenced the world yourself you have reached out and influenced the world as such as a the butterfly effect basically yes. well um, you know it, it, when this started happening to me i you know i'm an ordinary person i have an ordinary life i just have an extraordinary job and i knew if i was able to do this. And I believe that we are all psychic or intuitive, that I wanted to be a mentor for people. Um, I didn't have one. I had the angels guiding me and, tell, and, and teaching me, actually. And so I knew I wanted to be that person. So I have mentored people. And of course, as you said, the most notable one is Esther Hicks. And um, encouraged her to begin uh, channeling Abraham. And of course, she's impacted many lives globally. And I am appreciating that I got to be just a little bit of that um, expansiveness for the world to awaken and, and realize individuals to realize that they're more than their physical bodies. 
Well, this is what I love about you is that you make yourself accessible. And you're, you know, some people do things like you, but they kind of separate themselves from the rest of the world. Just the fact that you're doing my show uh, and, you know, agreeing to do this, I was beside myself because uh, you, you know, I was just like, why would she even want to do my show? But that's incredible that you make yourself like one of us. Well, I appreciate you saying that, but to me, my purpose is sharing the wisdom of Theo for all who have ears to hear, because it's it's teaching us how to tap into the truth of ourselves, and and that's something that we need right now, of course. But it's all about the changes that are coming. And we've all chosen to be here in these bodies. And if I can be a little um, way show of this new way of being, it's it's my purpose. It's a passion. It's a privilege and pleasure to be able to do it. And so your invitation to be on your show is just furthering my opportunity to encourage people to to really see themselves as more than they think they are. That's so beautiful. You know, I've had the privilege of um, speaking to Theo in the mid-2000s. It was 2007 or 2008 was the first time. And then 2014 mm -hmm. when my son died. And right now, <laughs> but we're about to have that experience. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, briefly. Actually, I spoke to you. I didn't speak to Theo during our, the seminar, which by the way, uh, I want to let the audience know that you um, hold seminars and, and classes to help people tap into their intuition and learn how to channel their higher self. And I think that's so beautiful that you did that. It was a wonderful, wonderful workshop. It was a two day workshop and uh, it was just, you created the space for things that are already there to awaken. And that was incredible. So if you're watching this, please go to asktheo.com and check it out because it's incredible. Yeah, happy. Actually, we have a 12-week course starting um, just an extension of the retreat that you are on that is similar, only a deeper dive into experiencing that we're more than our physical bodies. We call it um, psychic and spiritual exploration. And so thank you for encouraging people to go check that out because it's going to be starting right, I think this week. So it's, um, it's a great time to, to tap into that if you're interested. Thank you for letting us know. And, um, you know, when I, I submitted, I'd let people on TikTok, my social media, where I have more followers, um, let them know you're coming on and about 30, over 1300 questions were submitted. So we're going to ask all of them today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so, um, I kind of narrowed it down. I, do believe it or not? Um, what, about a third of those questions were, what's my life purpose? How do I find out what my life purpose is? So I have got those queued up. If you are ready, I am. we can um, ask Theo to join us. And I'll go through as many questions as I can in the next okay. 45 minutes. Okay, that sounds great. And I might just tell um, your, your community here how this happens. What I do is I close my eyes. I take a couple of deep, deep breaths. And Theo always comes in to me on my right side. They take over my vocal cords and then the entirety of my body. And as you know, when they speak, it's a, a bit of a different voice. And um, then they'll entertain questions. So I'm happy you have so many. Yes. Yeah, so okay. I'm ready. Here, here we go. This is the beginning, is it not? Hello, Theo. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We are appreciative of the opportunity to be of service to you, you may ask. Uh, I've had a lot of questions that I'm going to just throw at you, if you don't mind. And the very first one, 
is what is special about this time? Because we I've heard you talk about the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is a time you're living in now and have chosen to be incarnate for. The third dimension is your physical reality. The fourth has been in a spiritual awakening, an awakening to a realization that you're more than your physical bodies, that you're a soul having a human experience, not a human having a soulful experience. Your soul extends beyond your body. You have a physical body, your earth suit, to experience the the feelings, the senses that you have and to navigate this beautiful planet. Your souls are eternal, their vibrational frequency, and they are in this body experiencing a physical existence. The fifth dimensionary time is a greater awareness that the veils, if you would, between the multidimensionality of which you are, all energy, have thinned. And this is a time of consciousness shift never before on this planet in the human experience. The old patterns, the old ways of being do not work. And it's a new way of being human on the planet, not encumbered by old beliefs that have been passed along for thousands of years. It's a time of a greater empowerment and consciousness, meaning that you'll know more, be more, experience more. That will be your new ordinary, making the extraordinary your ordinary, if you would. You may ask. There is a t- There was a teacher named Dolores Cannon who talked about the fifth dimensional reality and kind of refer to the a new earth, but a lot of people are under the impression that there's going to be a separation. There's going to be two earths, the third dimensional and the fifth dimensional. Some people are going to be left behind on the third dimension. Um, is that, what do you think of that concept? And is it possible for people to not raise their level to the fifth dimensional reality? It is possible if they're embodied now when more are being born into it. So there won't be two worlds. But what you'll see is the consciousness shift of what we've been speaking about for five decades. This is a time where there's community, a common unity, a recognition that you're one species on this planet and that you're better together than you are apart. So it will not be divided There's been too much divisiveness in the past, in the third dimensional reality. There had been this old default system of fright, flight, fear, freeze, and beliefs that you are not good enough, worthy, a lack of unconditional love. And this is the change that is happening. An awareness of how to love the self unconditionally and realize the ones that is there are no separations between you even though there have tried to be these barriers between you there is not and in understanding you have that energetic connection always you are a part in experiencing the universal energies, the quantum field, if you would, it surrounds you. You are a part of it. And that extends beyond borders, perceived or not perceived borders between you. When you cross from one state to another, do you see a line other than the one on your map? If you cross from one country to another, there are no lines to be seen on the earth other than water that separates you. It is true you are one species. It matters not the color of the skin, the language that has been spoken, the gender. Which brings me to the question that why is there so much divisiveness right now on planet Earth, considering that we're entering the fifth dimension? 
and everyone is so becoming so extremely vocal, extreme on opposite ends. It is the old way of thinking of better than and lesser than that has separated you. And of course, that which is the need of change, the old will come to the surface to be changed. It's like having an illness in the body. You have fevers to burn out the old, to refresh the body, to burn out that in the cells, which is not its perfection. So what has been repressed, there's no hidden things. They will all surface to be seen, and that's what is happening. These old ways of thinking have surfaced, and those grappling with the need to control are scrambling, if you would, to try to control the mass, and they cannot. And that is what is permeating this old patterning that is dying away. There's no foundation to it. It's crumbling. And you see that on the planet itself. The foundations of your economic structures, your one economy. So those old structures will begin anew, even better still. And so this chaos on the planet will bring order, but it's just showing the areas in need of change. That's exactly what my thought was on the topic. So oh, that's amazing. My So I'm going to jump to a different topic, which is just kind of broad. And so many people ask, um, wh what is the meaning of life? Big question. Learning. You've chosen. It was not demanded of you to incarnate. Your soul desired it, chose it for the exquisite opportunity to learn, to learn emotions, to have the experience of the earth, to have the experience of the physicality, which is quite ex exquisite, actually. It's just a different mindset that you need to realize how magnificent it truly is. To see with different lenses, different perceptions. Understand that life will always challenge you because your soul came here to be challenged. That's how it best learns. It's the curriculum of life challenge. It's how you greet the challenge. You perceive the challenge. That it either has it as an opportunity to expand or to feel victimized by. Is that why there's suffering in the world? Because people are choosing to be victimized by it? Why is there so much suffering on planet Earth? Suffering is optional. It's a mindset. If you have the perception of these challenges that your soul draws to you as an opportunity of growth, if you have a growth mindset, you'll embrace them as the opportunity that they are and squeeze everything you can learn out of it rather than resist it. That which you resist will persist, and that which you resist will seem unsurmountable. If you embrace it, that is beautiful. it will be less hmm, challenging. What is one thing that humans struggle to achieve here that is useless on the other side? Nothing is pointless. Everything that you are inclined to strive for has purpose. For it's your soul's calling to understand, to know, to experience. Just as there's no question that is unimportant. 
For if it's a question in the mind, once satisfied, the mind is broader and more expanded and curious. Staying on the desire for discovery rather than shutting down. Do you see? Absolutely. Um, so beautifully put. Um, so the next question is one question that pretty much maybe 300 people or more ask, which is how do we figure out our life purpose? Because a lot of people just don't know what their life purpose is. Your life purpose is life itself, being born. What you're looking for is how to express your energy creatively and passionately. So if you had all of the resources that you need, everything you needed, what would you do? Most often, people have dreams and desires of things they wish to do and accomplish. But they live in a condition-based thinking of, I don't have this or that or enough. You have way more than you think you do. Much more than you think you do. But making a decision for a dream or a desired outcome then the universal energy will align with that to bring you what you need. How many times have all of you made a decision, a no-doubted decision, that something you must do in your life or have in your life, without doubt, you didn't know how it was going to happen, but you knew it was a must. And out of the blue, it all worked out. Because you made a demand for it. Your soul said, yes, for that being expressed through you and for you and to you. That's how it works. So when you have a dream, be steadfast. Most often, you become impatient. You have a life to live to accomplish these greater things in life. But make a decision for them. I am the man. I am the woman. Who is, does, has. Uh, I'm a spiritual life purpose coach. And I always tell my clients, you know, if you wouldn't fail, if you didn't think you were going to fail, what would you do? And people are like, well, that, you know, the ideas just keep popping up as soon as failure is put to the side. And so I kind and of understand like this. There is no failure. There's only feedback. The only way you fail is if you quit. You stop moving in the direction of the outcome you want. But what undermines many is time. If it is not instantly gotten, then one becomes disappointed. But understand this, moving in the direction of the outcome you want, is it worth it? Taking a step daily in that direction. You will know if it is something you truly want or if it's just a mild distraction. Your idea, your thought. If it's a distraction, you will not be steadfast about it. It won't keep coming up. But if it gives you life, when you think about it, there's an enthusiasm, even some excitement. Excitement has a bit of fear in it, doesn't it? And if there's a little bit of fear, good. Because what it's saying to you, that will grow you and expand you. How do you 
get rid of doubt when it festers inside of you. Doubt is often coming from a belief that you're not worthy of the outcome you want. Or you have a belief that you adopted that you don't deserve it. And most often it's a a little fragmented aspect of your soul that creates the wobble or doubt or fear. The adult The adult is not the one that is emotionally reactive. It is these little aspects of self that become triggered, that have doubt or fear. So the adult you can communicate with these aspects, these parts of yourself that wobble, letting them know that you love them and they're not alone and that you are doing it together. Kind of like the inner child. It's like the inner child, but it's much more expanded because they're parts of your soul. The inner child is specific to this incarnation, but when you tap into these parts of the soul that are influenced by these beliefs of not being worthy, they're more than just one incarnation. Okay, so the next question I have is something that everyone keeps asking and <clears throat> I'm asking them on their behalf because some people are afraid of death. And the question is, what is death? What is the death process like? What happens after we die? First, it's birth to birth. Your soul is eternal. It's an eternal energy. So you birth into this human physical body and when it's time and you're complete with an incarnation, this soul leaves the body and births back into its multidimensional existence. And so understanding there's no death per se, there's just a relinquishment of form. But most are afraid of death because they're afraid of pain or what they might experience. And understand this, it is quite exquisite. I I always figure it would be like waking up almost as opposed to dying. It's waking up just out of your body. But many of you have out-of-body experiences. Because the soul can go in and out of the body with intention. Again, it's not limited to it, but you will not lose the body if you're having an out-of-body experience. You only think body and you're back in it. But when it is time, and each soul knows the time of departure of the physical body or the incarnation, But it's all the preconceived ideas and beliefs about self that create fear that have been visited upon one by outside influences. And those beliefs can change. Some people asked about, you know, the process for someone who's dying, who's been a horrible person, you know, or harmed others, as opposed to someone who's had a wonderful, you know, been kind. Um, How is the process different? You know, because people ask about heaven and hell and what happens if you feel like you've been a bad person and now you're afraid to die? Because that's a belief that's been visited upon people for thousands of years. This thought of hell. It's been put there to control them. It's a perception as well. And so when one thinks of this person is bad and this person is good, it's a judgment, isn't it? One cannot judge another, for you know not what the soul's purpose or what the soul's learning is to be. 
However, there are people who do bad things in this dimension. It's important to know that hurting people, hurting people hurt, are hurt and hurt easily, are hurt easily and reactive to that, and so they hurt others as well. Is a retaliation. And that's all coming from a lack of love, ultimately. So if you're thinking, what would love do? In any action that you make, what would love do? Rather than a retaliatory, all right, you hurt me, I'll hurt you. If you understand that hurting people hurt others and are reactive and all coming from a fear, a fear-based life. So coming into that confidence of an unconditional love, state of being, because it's not a feeling, it's a state of being then you won't attract that which it is that is not that to your life. Loving the self enough changes everything. Would you say that's pretty much the answer to everything? To, uh, accessing love, unconditional love, the answer to peace on earth? Yes. It's an integrated process, actually. And it sounds very simple, and the words are simple. But to achieve that takes commitment and desire and awareness. Um, my question, next question is, what is the process before we come into these bodies? How do we decide who our parents are? What do we do? What's the process? Yes, you choose to come in at the time you come in to the physical existence. And understand this, it's like winning the lottery to have a body. So lucky you. You have body. You won that lottery. You get the experience of the earthly plane. Again, quite explicit. And groups incarnate together to support each other's growth. And that means that you're on the same vibration frequency. Is that a soul family? Soul family are same frequency beings choosing to come to support each other. And sometimes that support is challenging. But you, we speak of soul family, soul mates, all of these terminologies, but they are the souls that you recognize and know out of the tens of thousands of people you meet in a lifetime, how many are you truly attracted to? Do you recognize as I know you? But when you recognize that, have a, an experience of that with another, you can be assured, whether it's positive or negative, you've known them. I know that because I've met so many of my soul family. I've been so fortunate. But my other question is, some I had some parents and some children talk about parents that have disowned them or children that have run off and disappeared and it's hurting them because they miss their mom or they miss their son or daughter. And they just, you know, they or parents that raised their children and now the child is gone or vice versa, you know, not that they raised their parents, but what do you say to those people that have, that have, or don't have access to someone that they love and they raised or they grew up with? So those have been choices, haven't they? Of disassociating, separating. And it usually comes from judgment, judging each other. 
or expectations that have been unmet or unsatisfied. Communication has been extremely important and the relinquishment of judgment of each other. What would love do? Yes? Yeah, and I just wonder, there are parents that, you know, their kids are run off, for example. There's a reason they've run off. And at some point, there can be an imbalance in the physicality and an imbalance in the chemistry of that physicality that has created what you call mental illness. But it's an imbalance. Just like any functionality in the body that is not perfectly aligned, such as the pancreas not working properly or any other organ, can be corrected. It's just an imbalance. But oftentimes there's judgment and reactivity to those things particularly chemistry imbalances that affect mental functionality. And at times there is that running away from, but there's always a reason for that. Yes? Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to ask you uh, more of a controversial topic, um, and it's um, when does the soul enter the body? I'm only asking that because there's a lot of talk about abortion, and and I just want to know when does the soul enter the body, and what is your view on abortion? Understand this. A soul would not enter a body if it knew, and souls know, if it were not going to have a, a life. It would not enter that fetus. We find it interesting that that there is this judgment about each other. And the need to control others' lives in such a way. Optimum health is what you should be seeking for everyone. Thank you. I think that answered that question very well. Um, The next question is the biggest question. And uh, it's a two-parter, but I'll ask the first one. What is God? A solid state of unconditional love. It is not an entity with white hair and a long beard sitting on a mountain. You are a part of that energy, the God energy, creation. You are all connected to it. And that's what we're trying to impress upon you. The magnificence of that energetically that is in each and every soul. My son, who's five, actually, I have twin five-year-old sons, asked me to ask this question. Well, they ask me this question every day. They say, who made God? God is omnipresent, all-existing, eternal. So there was no before? No. I'll find a way to explain that. <laughs> um, they, they ask me that every day. The next question I have. Maybe you should say you are. Well, they say who made God. So they are always know what came before. That's always their question. What came before? Ah, the chicken or the egg. Yes. Okay, so let's ask the next question that a lot of people want to know is um, how do we attract our soulmates and is it important to meet our soulmates in this lifetime or are some people supposed to be alone? Everything's relational. Everything you do is relational. It has to do with others, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
And to even ask that question, you already know that it's true because you there's a desire in that question itself, isn't it? And of course you're meant to be together. And it is a choice to do so. But that's where the integrative process assists you because you're becoming the relationship. First and foremost, the relationship to the self is important. To have an expectation of an unconditional loving relationship, you must be it. And then you attract it to you and you make it welcome you allow it in but there's no doubt about the deservability of that love for many people it's hard because they i think they think they don't deserve it or they're not pretty enough or they just haven't met the person they're like there's no one out there or some people feel like time is running out what do you say to those people? Time isn't running out. But there is no time. It's just a perception of time. You have night and you have day. And then someone created clocks. And time as a linear concept. Yes? But understand this. The only thing to be done, not to think of time running out, but are you open and receptive to relationship? Many question it because they see patterns of relationships in their lives that haven't worked out. And that has to do with the, the integrative process that we brought forth, the soul integrative process, to release beliefs about yourself that are simply untrue, that are unloving. The beliefs that are not deserving, the not enoughnesses. And when you give yourself that unconditional love, you become aware that you are worthy of the relationship you desire. And you do that process and loving the self that makes you a beacon of light to attract to you its likeness. Would money also be something that you just want to feel, we should just feel like you deserve or it's, it's what's keeping money away for some people? Beliefs. A lack of belief. A not enough, not worthy. Many ways of what do you think about money? Money has no energy in and of itself. It's just an exchange for goods and services. It's all belief-oriented, isn't it? And some have carried forward a belief over much time that those who have money are bad and those who don't are good. That's been a belief system that has been passed along generationally for thousands of years. And so where there are some who get money and have to spend it or get it away from them because of that belief. So what are your beliefs about money? Money will not go where it's not loved. That's powerful. Um, my next question is about addiction. And what advice do you give someone that has uh, a strong addiction to substances and has a hard time quitting? It seems redundant, but uh, the human condition is addiction in many different forms, you see. However, 
the addiction to substances is usually predominantly to cover up uncomfortable feelings. Become friendly with uncomfortable feelings. The spectrum of emotions is what you've come to learn. And so oftentimes the the need to not be uncomfortable is so great that one becomes addicted to substances to not feel or to tap into what one would call the good feelings. And so in the integrated process, there's a realization of the expectation of unconditional love has not been met. In quite the opposite, in life experiences, there have been opportunities to judge the self harshly or others to judge the self as well as not being worthy or good enough. The fear of abandonment in human condition is what often drives the acquiescence of power and the acceptance of beliefs about self that are untrue, unloving, that can permeate the need to not feel. Basically, love is, once again, the answer to everything. It is. It seems very simple, but application is difficult, isn't it? Absolutely. And which brings me to my own question, which is, you know, I have, like I said, I have two five-year-olds and one of them is rather defiant. And I, the calm me, the calm version of me goes aside and I get very tested and testy as he defies things or throws a tantrum. What do you recommend to a parent that has a very stubborn child. Love is important, yes, but appropriate behavior is important as well. And so what he learns by by being obstinate and is control. So if he throws a tantrum, ignore it. The more you feed into it, the more he'll throw the tantrum because he's controlling the situation. Walk away. Thank you for that. Um, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask, try to squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, one we is... have one other comment about your son. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, He's very bright. As you know, they both are. But he particularly wa- is, wants to know why. You tell him something and he says no. If you explain to him, this is why we're doing this or this is why I'm asking this of you then he'll he'll understand and respond. He just wants to know more information than I want you to do this. Absolutely. You're right on point. Um, So I'm skipping all over the place with these questions because they're all, all over the place. But the next one is, about our past lives. Why don't we remember anything when we're born? Why do we not remember our past lives? It's unnecessary unless it is. And you will have spontaneous recall when necessary. Here too, the integrative process assists you in tapping into that multidimensionality of the soul. Understand this, if you think in terms of the soul being like a diamond with many facets, what gives the diamond brilliance is the refracting light off the facets. Lifetimes are like that in the soul. And if 
there's a need to know something of the past that's influential in your present, it will be given you. It, you will have a spontaneous recall or a knowing in answer to a question of the soul. There is a gentleman, his name is Matthias de Stefano, that actually remembers living on another planet millions of years ago. And he remembers so many things and I, you know, and he remembers it. So I guess if he remembers it because it's relevant, then any of us, if it was relevant, we would remember it. I'm... Correct. Which brings me to the, probably the last question, which is about life on other planets. And there, um, I'm just going to assume there's life on other planets. <laughs> and I'm wondering how much beings from other planets have influenced our planet's evolution, our human evolution? If you could imagine, the soul has billions of choices of incarnating. The earth is only one. So, if you could imagine that you have had another planetary experience other than Earth. Because you have. It's been a choice. The Earth is only one. That's a very myopic viewpoint. We wish you to open the aperture of your perception to know there are Forty thousand other planets in your universe that could sustain life. Science knows this. You just don't know where they are yet. Right. You can't possibly know or even perceive because the mind has not the perceptivity of the enormity of it all. But if you would look at the pictures that are taken of your universe in space, it can give you a bit of a concept of how vast it is. If you look into your night sky and see the stars, you can see in your Milky Way a constellation called the Pleiades. That's another universe. And there are five planets that are seen but what's unseen? It is so vast. The intellectual mind at this point is unable to perceive because the conscious mind thinks in terms of what's already known or pictures that one has already seen. And you have not seen it yet. But you will. And you will have the breadth of perceptivity to understand it. And that's the evolution of the fifth dimension. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're out of time. Thank you so much for being part of this experience and, and help, helping my path on this earth um, become more rich. Um, I am forever grateful. We are grateful for the opportunity to serve. You are complete with your asking. Well, I could ask all day, but yes, the time is up. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are complete for now. God's love on to you. Good day. Hi, happy. It's good to be back. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sheila. That was so incredible and amazing. And I got a lot of my questions answered, which is incredible. You oh, are great. You are literally an angel, figuratively an angel. You are heaven sent, <laughs> all of the above, and literally, quite literally heaven sent. Um, thank you so much. I don't want to take any more of your time than you've given me. Um, oh, it's I, been my pleasure to be with you. I've enjoyed being here and uh, thanks for the invitation. We'll do it again sometime. 
I look forward to it. And I know that our journey together as Happy and Sheila are not over and it's just beginning. I'll look forward to it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank bye you. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Bye.